So getting into the Flash, Sins of the Father, this really brings us to a prelude, really the, the prelude to the button. Now, the cool thing about this is that in terms of being a prelude, it's one of several. Within the realm of, of DC Rebirth so far, there's been like an actual essential reading prelude, which if you guys are down with like the essential reading concepts, uh, Joel over at Cape Joel does like essential reading, where it's like, here are the things that you need to read in order to understand what's going on with something, which uh, I actually use Joel's essential reading from time to time uh, if I'm not sure where to start with a character. So, so <laughs> I don't know if Benny does it, but I do that from time to time. Um, but the other half of this is that, you know, this this really kind of gives us the, the tried and true uh, prelude. For the most part, if all you want to do is read the button and all you want to know is what you need to read in order to read the button, in order to understand the button, well, then you've got DC Universe Rebirth number one and this, and that's really it. But for me, I like the little tidbits, the little goodies that we get, you know, throughout DC Universe Rebirth. So I would say there's like a handful of issues with Superman and there's some action comic stuff and there's some Batman stuff. I don't have a play List. It'll basically have all the things that we need in order to understand what's going on. You know, for example, Trinity number eight, Superman Aftermath, uh, or Superman Reborn Aftermath, deals with the fallout of the whole thing, Mr. Oz, and all that kind of good stuff. But in terms of just focusing on the button and the Batman's uh, Flash landscape, it's just DC Universe Rebirth number one and this, and then the Batman Detective Comics and the Flash Comics, and that's that's really it. But one thing to keep in mind is this story really comes out of the DC Rebirth Flash story, which is basically Flash of two worlds. You know, Wally West of two Earths, and what this was, or at least what this did, is it basically gave us the idea that Daniel West was the father of the new 52 Wally West. Now, the reason why this matters is because ever since this revelation took place, it's been on the mind of Wally non-stop, and it even reflects the dreams that he has, right? Like this dream that he's having right now, where he's talking to Daniel. Daniel says, look, you need to study, you need to stay in school, you need to focus on your education, because if you don't, you know, you're going to be like me. You're going to become a killer just like me. Now, the reason why this is so important is because not only is this revelation of Daniel West being the the father of Wally West, always on the mind of Wally, but Daniel was a guy who gained Speed Force powers and then became a villain. Now, in truth, the way that Daniel's character was written was always designed to be in such a way that it would send him down this path. And that was one of the things that a lot of fans found kind of weird and and, and really one of those things that kind of alienated some fans of, of the traditional reverse Flash role. And what I mean by that is that if you walk up to almost any Flash fan and you say, who who do you think the best reverse Flash is? I would say, and, and this is really me just kind of spitballing and, and ballparking, nine, like eight or nine out of 10 will say Eobard Thawne. That's the definitive reverse Flash. It's the one they think of. It's the one that was basically reimagined under the writing of Mark Wade and the post-Crisis on Infinite Earths landscape is the guy who came from the 25th century and just got revenge or, you know, became a villain of Barry Allen. It's the one that Jeff Johns basically reworked when we when we learned that Eobard Thawne had basically engineered all the events that led to Barry Allen becoming the Flash in the first place. Uh, it's Barry's mortal enemy. And so because of all that development, because of the great little moments that we got and Flashpoint, different things like that. At the end of the day, it was really just Eobard Thawne being solidified as the definitive reverse Flash. The problem with this is that when New 52 was launched, as good as a lot of the Flash stuff was, when the New 52 was launched and Daniel West was introduced as a guy who basically just gained, you know, gained Speed Force powers, you know, after surviving an explosion, you know, he wasn't really as fast as Barry, but he was still basically a villain. The issue with this is that the way it was done by Francis Manipul, I believe was the one that wrote it at the time, was that it was designed to juxtapose the story of of Barry Allen with Daniel West in the sense that where Barry Allen's past was haunted or really his life was haunted by the death of his mother when he was young at the hands of Eobard Thawne, Daniel West was haunted by the fact that his father was abusive and his goal was to go into the past and kill his father. But the string that tied Daniel West and Barry together was the idea that a parent was going to die, a parent in their past was going to die. But again, fans didn't really care for this, they didn't really like it. And so for the most part, Daniel West was relatively short-lived. You know, he was the reverse flash and then fans were like, nope, give us Eobard Thawne or nothing at all. And so the result was that Daniel West really just kind of fell into the background in a lot of different ways. Now, with regards to this little bit here, uh, with Wally gaining the powers of the Flash during the whole Lightning Strikes Twice, uh, Twice event, the idea here was that he was afraid that he would become Daniel West. He would become his father. And so because of this, these little moments, you know, this breakfast, for example, that's shared between uh, Barry and his father and Iris really haunts Wally West because of the fact that he looks at the, the, the jokes and he looks at the laughs that Barry has with his dad and knows that he can never experience that. Now, this is what's also kind of interesting interesting here is because it is Joshua Williamson basically saying that Barry and, and Wally aren't that far removed, right? I mean, Barry shares these moments with his dad because he's basically playing catch up for almost the entirety of his of his life, you know, from his childhood going into his adult life. His father was essentially framed for a murder that he didn't commit. You know, his father was the one that was more or less forced to take the rap of the death of Nora Allen, Barry's mother, when Reverse Flash Eobard Thawne went back in time and killed her. And so because of this, uh, Barry's never really had time or had a chance to spend these kind of moments 
moments with his dad. With Wally, it's similar. His father was a bad guy. His father was presumably killed, or at least seems to have been killed at the very least, just vanished off the radar as far as, as, far as Wally knows at the moment. And so because of that, he's basically wanting to experience these same moments that, you know, that, that Barry experiences with his father. And that's what's kind of cool about this is because we've all had those moments, right? You know, like, like you're, you're a single person, a single guy or a single girl, and you see couples laughing and carrying on or something like that, and you want that. Or maybe you lost a parent when you were younger and you see other people spending time with their parents and you want that. Or God forbid, you're a parent who lost a kid and you're in the same boat. Uh, people experience all these different kinds of situations where they say, I wish I had that too. And it's cool because it allows those people who come from that kind of experience to identify with what Wally's doing. And that's why I love the way Joshua Williamson is basically reworking the new 52 Wally West because instead of just being this young, angsty kid who's angry because the world doesn't understand him, instead, he's now a kid who's trying to find his dad. And that's the coolest thing about this is because it makes it more visceral, makes it more real, it makes it more personal. And so again, it's really cool to, to kind of see how this unfolds. But the fact remains here, because these moments are being shared, Wally West effectively just runs. Now, the reason why Joshua Williamson does this, the reason why he injects these little moments where Wally West can't really cope with the situation and just takes off running is for a couple reasons. The first is because within the story, it gives Wally the ability to clear his head, to basically just kind of sit down and say, look, I need to think things over. I need to mull things over. I can just run around the planet a couple times and be okay. Outside of the story, what is Joshua Williamson doing is basically saying, we're going to be expanding Wally West powers because the ability of a person to run faster, to be able to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do when they first become a Flash is like a muscle, right? You know, the more you do curls, the more you do preacher curls, the more you do bench presses, the more you do squats, the more you do these exercises, the stronger your muscles get. You get these muscles built much the same way that Wally West expands on his powers the more he uses them. He becomes more in tune with his ability to become a Flash. So it's really subtly just kind of Joshua Williamson, you know, saying, hey, look, this is how Wally's growing in his abilities. Now, ultimately, what we end up learning here is that Wally had done some investigation on his own with regards to the fate of Daniel West. And what he had learned was that Daniel West had basically been imprisoned at Iron Heights and then had been transferred from Iron Heights to Bell Reef Penitentiary. Now, as soon as Barry hears that Daniel West is in Bell Reef, he begins to freak out. And the reason why is because we as comic readers know that Bell Reef is the last stop, man. <laughs> Bell Reef is where people go when they've been shanghaied into the suicide squad. And so because of that, Barry Allen's initial thought is, oh my God, Daniel West is now part of the suicide squad. And so because of this, you know, he had Wally basically race off, but this is Joshua Williamson taking things in a different approach, right? Like we would expect Barry and Wally to just kind of race in and then look around, figure out there's nothing there and then race out. And they would be there for maybe two or three seconds and nobody would have any idea what's going on. But what Williamson does is he draws on the Justice League versus Suicide Squad. He says, no, 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 like, this is not just some military base. It's not just some building, some office building somewhere. This is the base of operations for Amanda Waller and the Suicide Squad. Every precaution that can be taken has been taken. And that's the coolest thing is because Barry says, we can't just run in. Now he doesn't tell Wally why. He just says, we can't run in. We have to be smart because if anybody knows that we're here, we're immediately gonna be caught. And that's true. Amanda Waller would immediately know that they're there and would immediately kick in safeguards. Now, the cool thing about this is that that still happens. And as Joshua Williamson showing us just how capable Amanda Waller is, and that's why I love her character so much is because she's, she's prepared for almost every eventuality and she will do whatever it takes to make sure that she comes out on top, even if it means killing everybody around her. The other funny part about this is that where these different guards show up and try to take out Flash and, uh, or try to take out Barry Allen and Wally, Wally and, and Barry are able to take them out. But then Wally gets a little cocky. He's like, man, why are you worried about these guys? These are robots, man. They're dudes in metal suits. Like they're nothing to worry about. And Barry's like, yeah, they're nothing to worry about. She is something to worry about enter Amanda Waller. And that's what's crazy is because we know that Amanda Waller would make no bones about snatching up Barry Allen and Wally West and throwing them into the Suicide Squad. Now, in truth, it probably wouldn't last for very long. I mean, I have a hard time believing that Amanda Waller could force Barry Allen to do anything, but it's possible. It could be done. Barry Allen knows this and he doesn't really say it in so many words, but he's like, look, if Amanda Waller so chose, she could find a way to neutralize my powers. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in a couple weeks, or in a few months, you know, I'll be coming out of a store or something like that. I'll be, you know, coming out of work as Barry Allen. And then suddenly everything goes black. I wake up in a room somewhere shackled, unable to vibrate through anything. And Amanda Waller says, welcome to the Suicide Squad. So, you know, it's entirely possible that something like that could happen. And with that in mind, Barry is kind of playing the double role, right? Like he doesn't want Wally to know what it is that Amanda Waller is actually doing. Because if Wally came to the realization that Daniel West had been inducted or been forced onto a team that literally just goes 
goes through suicide missions and the person sending him on those missions doesn't care whether he lives or dies, it would crush Wally. And so because of that, Barry doesn't actually reference the Suicide Squad. He just says, hey, look, if he's part of your little project, you know, then there's going to be hell to pay. But of course, Amanda Waller, being as dubious and being as full of lies as she is, is basically, look, I don't know what you're talking about. There's nobody named Daniel West here. Now, she's actually telling the truth, but she's not telling the whole truth. And we'll find out what the whole truth is uh, here in a little bit. But with Barry and Wally basically leaving again, Wally asked the question, what project are you talking about? What is it that they do here? And Barry's like, well, you know, we'll talk about that another time. But if Daniel West was part of Amanda, uh, Amanda Waller's project, there's a guy who will know. And so what we do is we actually jump back to the uh, jump to the Australian Outback with Digger Harkness. Now, this is cool because this is Joshua Williamson showing us or really kind of expanding on how the Suicide Squad functions in a lot of ways. Now, remember, this is DC Rebirth. So, so a lot of this is new to a lot of different people. And one of the things that people think of when they think of the Suicide Squad is they just, they just you know, bah, 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 bah. they just come in guns blazing. You know, I mean, they just start just shooting everything up. But for the most part, what, what Joshua Williamson establishes here is that it's not always that way. The Suicide Squad is clandestine, espionage first, shoot everything all to pieces second. Digger Harkness is kind of an extension of that. Like it's basically, a, you know, Amanda Waller saying, hey, look, there is a group operating out of Australia called the Weaver Clan. We have reason to believe they're developing weapons or they're in possession of weapons that can neutralize people with superpowers. Go there, infiltrate them, find out if they have something. If they have nothing, say they have nothing, come back, your mission's done. If they have something, make their something our something and then kill them. But what ends up happening here is that while uh, Digger's asking questions and trying to infiltrate the Weaver Clan, Barry and Wally show up out of nowhere. So they kind of throw a, a kink, you know, throw a kink in his plans and, and so on, leading to the three of them being captured by the Weaver Clan proper. Now, the funny thing about this is that uh, Joshua Williamson kind of toys with us a little bit. Like he plays it fast and loose, right? He's just kind of like, hey, like the, the Weaver Clan have like this web that just neutralizes Barry's ability to phase through objects and Wally West can't phase through the thing either. And, you know, of course, Zigna Harkness just throws boomerang. So they're all basically prisoner <laughs> storytelling. So it's <laughs> it's kind of cool. I mean, I I, I liked it. You know, I, I, I thought it was a, a great little influx because when it comes to comic books, it's walking a knife set telling us stories. Uh, whenever you're telling a story in comics, there is such a thing as just giving everybody everything, right? Like there has to be some measure of just us figuring things out on our own. Uh, and we'll talk more, you know, talk a little bit more about that when it comes to uh, the ending of the story. But uh, there's also the idea of not leaving everything ambiguous and making people feel like they don't understand anything that's going on. And so because of that, you know, it's just kind of fun. It's a little bit of fun here. Well, for whatever reason, they have, you know, this weird webbing that vibrates at a frequency that, that Barry Allen can't vibrate through, you know, and Wally West doesn't know how to vibrate through things. And Digger Harkness is just a guy. So they're all pretty much just held captive and it works, you know, for what it is. Now, of course, what this does is it leads into uh, just a quick little bit of storytelling and a little bit of, of Williamson just kind of killing time in terms of, uh, of, of filling out this comic. Uh, what we end up having here is the Weaver Clan freeing Barry Allen and Digger Harkness. Of course, Digger basically saying, hey, look, if your weapons are as solid as you say they are, then like kill the Flash, right? If your weapons can kill the Flash, imagine the marketing that you'll get. Hey guys, we have guns that kill the Flash, the fastest man alive. Don't you want to buy them? And then people will just line up to buy those weapons, right? Because of that, uh, it basically allows, you know, Barry and, and Digger to just kind of run around and, you know, for the, the Weaver Clan to kind of shoot at them and prove their weapons can hit the fastest man alive. But it all serves as a distraction because with Wally West, he's not able to vibrate through things simply because of the fact that when he tries, he ends up blowing stuff up. And so when he does try to vibrate, he ends up destroying the bonds and then takes out these members of the Weaver Clan. So coming to the rescue of Barry and Digger, they're able to take out the Weaver Clan, and that's really the end of that. I mean, it's not a great big, huge, drawn-out thing. It's not like the Weaver Clan will be back. It's nothing like that. You know, they're just taken prisoner, and, and that's the end of them. And so, because of that, uh, we end up having, you know, a conversation between Digger and Wally, where, you know, Wally basically says, hey, look, you know, Daniel West is my dad, and I just want to know what happened to my dad. Now, this is cool, because this is Williamson basically saying, hey, look, you know, Digger Harkness is a guy that throws, like, really sharp boomerangs, and he's kind of cool, depending on, you know, what kind of characters you like, but he's also human at the same time. And with his own backstory and his own ex own experiences, he feels where Wally's coming from. And so what he basically says is, look, as far as I know, here's what happened. And so what we're basically told is that the Suicide Squad were sent on a mission. Daniel West basically ended up running a bomb into the ocean and then died in the explosion. Now, there's a little more to it than this. This was covered in Suicide Squad Annual Number 1. And what had actually happened here is that in the midst of a Suicide Squad mission, under normal circumstances, Amanda Waller cares nothing about bystanders. If bystanders die, let them die. So long 
as the mission is completed. Daniel West was constantly on this path trying to redeem himself. The last holdout was the fact that in his own origin story, when he wanted to go back in time and kill his abusive father, he kept arguing that was what he was wanting to do. He made the right call. But in terms of a traditional villain as we knew him, he was basically becoming a better person. And so this was like the restorative act. This was basically him uh, trying to become a good guy, restoring people's view of him in terms of being a legit person. And so what ended up happening here is there was a bomb that threatened to destroy a village and Daniel raced the bomb into the ocean so that it would it would detonate safely away from everybody else, but was basically sucked into the vortex when he tripped and fell in his attempt to get away. Now, the reason why this happened was because of the fact that Daniel just was not as fast as Barry Allen. And so he wasn't able to get away as fast as Barry Allen would have. The result was that the explosion took place in such a way that we saw like a charred skeletal hand and the implication was that Daniel West was dead. Now, this is DC basically toying with the idea of, well, maybe he'll come back. And it's really just going through and sampling things. If fans want to see Daniel West return, the possibilities there. DC can make the case and say, well, he can't run as fast as the Flash, so he can't heal as fast as the Flash. So he was basically just healing this entire time and now he's back. Or it could simply just be that fans don't want him there and they're like, yeah, no, Daniel West is dead. He died in that explosion in Suicide Squad Annual Number 1. You remember that? I mean, that, that would be it, you know? And so again, it, it allows DC to kind of go both ways, which is a really smart way to play it. The problem is that with, with Wally learning that his father has effectively been killed, um, he immediately just races off. Now, this is a really great moment or a really great exchange between Wally and Barry, simply because of the fact that Wally basically asks the question at the heart of everything. He basically says, look, you know, I idolized my father. I idolized Daniel West. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be fast. I wanted to be what I thought the hero was. But the one question that he wants to know more than anything, uh, anything else is, why didn't he want to be my father? And is it because there's something wrong with me? This is Wally West with abandonment issues. That's all that is. It's a son that feels abandoned by his father and it humanizes Wally West so well. But what ends up happening here is Barry says, look, there's nothing wrong with you and reveals his identity. Now, this is kind of interesting because earlier, essentially what had happened was Barry in a discussion with his father during breakfast before Wally West had taken off. His father said, look, you should tell Wally and you should tell Iris that you're the Flash. They need to know. They need to be able to trust you. And this would be the ultimate demonstration of trust to reveal to them your own identity. Now, of course, Barry's response to this was always, no, 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 because if somebody knows, you know, realizes that they know who I am, well, then suddenly their motive shifts away from, well, I'm going to take you captive and hold you ransom so that I can get to the Flash. Instead, they'll just say, well, I'm just going to torture you until you tell me the identity of the Flash and then I'll kill you. And so because of that, it, it puts them in a, a much higher level of danger. The other half of this is that Barry basically runs over the entirety of his origin with Wally West. Now, of course, we don't really need to run over that. We have that new origin of Barry already covered here on my channel. But it, but again, it's Barry trying to create trust with Wally. The problem is that Wally's response is, you're a liar. You are a liar and you are a cheat. If you really, really loved Iris, if you really cared about me, you would have trusted us. You would have given us this information. You would have said, these are two people that I can trust. And it makes sense because for God's sake, Wally and Flash were running side by side. If anything, it would create a stronger friendship between the two of them if Barry did reveal his identity to Wally West. But at the same time, there's also merit to the argument that Barry's making because Wally West does not have full control of his abilities. Wally West is nowhere near as fast as Barry Allen. He's just not there yet. He will be, but he's just not there yet. And so because of that, if somebody got a hold of Wally, because Wally's young, because he's rash, because he's impulsive. If he let the moment get the better of him, which we've seen it happen, well then suddenly they start torturing him for the information, for the for the identity of Barry Allen. And so because of that, you know, Barry's basically trying to play the smart road. He was trying to make the smart decision here. And so what ends up happening is we actually jump back to Iron Heights Penitentiary. And the indication here is that we basically just have the arrival of Eobard Thawne. Now, the idea here, or the implication here seems to be that Eobard Thawne basically breaks free of the cell that he was being confined in or the suit that he was being held in. We're not told explicitly how that happens. We're simply just told that it happens. But he basically says that he remembers the whole idea of Thomas Wayne killing him during the events of Flashpoint and that he's going to get his revenge on Bruce Wayne. Now, this is kind of an interesting scenario in the realm of comics. And this is where we sort of reference the whole idea of the tightrope. Again, you know, this goes directly into, like it literally segues directly into Batman number 21. But with regards to this whole tightrope of, of storytelling, this version of Eobard Thawne, the question is, is why does he remember 
remember Flashpoint? You know, does he remember things before Flashpoint? And so the, the whole notion here is, is in terms of him being here in this moment, the fact that he was dead, that he's returned, is Joshua Williamson saying time travel and Eobard Thawne go hand in hand. For the same reason that Eobard Thawne is destined for all eternity to travel into the past and kill Nora Allen, setting in motion the events for Barry to become, uh, become the Flash, this is always going to happen. He's always going to show up here now. He's always going to be in the present. Every way that he's appeared in the realm of DC Comics will always happen. That will always take place because in the future, he travels into the past. So again, it's, it's really kind of crazy in terms of how it all unfolds. But the idea here is that, again, this just goes directly into the whole uh, Batman number 21 and into the button event itself. Okay, Rob Cor, we're going to be dangerous. We're going to be dangerous. Some of you might love me. Some of you might hate me. We're going to do the button, but we're going to do one video for each of the comics. So one and two come out today, and then three and four should come out uh, later on this week, probably Thursday, maybe Wednesday. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, we're going to try this and we're going to see what happens because it's only four issues. It's not like it's six. So it's not like it's going to take us, you know, days to do. It'll take us a couple of days. And so I figured we'd go ahead and give it a shot. But the button, oh my God, dude, this story is so good. It's one of the most anticipated stories. I've been looking forward to it for a long time, but I think it's one of the most anticipated stories of DC Rebirth because this finally gives us some measure of answering the question, what's going on with the button? Now, for those of you guys who are just now joining the DC Comics landscape because the button's really kind of a, a big talking point among the comic book community, we don't know anything that's going on. All we know is that in DC Universe Rebirth number one, when the button that previously belonged to the comedian before he died in the Watchmen comics suddenly appeared in the Batcave, it set in motion nothing but speculation about the Watchmen, about what was going on. We had this enigmatic guy, Mr. Oz, who was talking about people that are in the New 52 universe that shouldn't be there, about how things are screwed up and so on and so forth. But we literally know nothing about what's going on. The only thing that this has given us is the idea that in some form or fashion, the Watchmen are being folded into the DC universe. And so the idea that people had is that maybe it was Dr. Manhattan who had messed with all these things, that according to Wally West, somebody took 10 years away from everybody's life and we didn't know who it was. So maybe it was Manhattan Manhattan, maybe it was, you know, at least if you're Sal over at Comic Pop, you believe that Mr. Oz is the pre-New 52 Lex Luthor, which I love that idea, uh, but it's just, it's speculation reigning supreme, which is really half the fun, but the, the button thing is is so cool. This story is, is so amazing. So, um, initially, we pick up with Saturn Girl. Saturn Girl is part of the Legion of Superheroes. They're superheroes from the 31st century. They're from the future. Now, all we really know about her in terms of the DC landscape is that in DC Universe Rebirth number one, in Batman number nine or Batman Rebirth number nine. And in this story, we've seen her in Arkham Asylum. We don't know why she's there. We don't know who put her there. It seems like she's there against her will. We have no idea what's going on. All we know is that she's there, but it's so ironic that she's in a home for the mentally insane because Saturn girl being from the future would likely know how these events are going to play out. Now, again, this deals a little bit in terms of like retcons and stuff like that, because non-comic readers would ask the question, well, if she knew this was going to play out, then why didn't she tell anybody about it before? Well, because this is a new introduction to comic. So again, somebody's kind of messing with things, but the fact remains here. It's like a ripple effect or it's, it's like a scar effect, right? Like, like if time were linear, all right, you, there were no alternate realities or anything like that. If I go back to you and I meet you when you're five years old and I cut your hand, then at 50 years old, when I went back in time in the first place, you would suddenly see a scar appear on your hand out of nowhere. All right. It's just basically the fact that the past influences the future. And so because of that, you know, most likely we would have to believe that if she's from the 31st century, that her memories would automatically be updated to reflect whatever it is that's going to happen with regards to the Watchmen. Now we know that she has an understanding of the future because of the fact that she's watching a hockey game unfold. And in this hockey game, one of the players gets killed, but no one comes and saves him. There's no Superman, no Justice League, no nothing. It's just a guy dies during a hockey game. But the reason why this is introduced is because it is Tom King basically kind of throwing in this whole idea of allowing the narrative of the story to be reflected by the hockey game. Because with the narrative, or at least with the, the broadcast as it's given to us, it's okay, here's the opening salvo. Like the puck is down, the players are playing, you know, and they are kind of going back and forth. All right, let's pass the puck to this guy, pass the puck to that guy. The puck representing information, speculation, the idea of what's going to happen, the knowledge of what this button represents, this kind of going back and forth. But the hockey team also represents players in the DC universe, superheroes, the Justice League, so on and so forth, the opposing team, perhaps even the Watchmen. And so it's kind of cool to see this unfold because what ends up happening, or at least, you know, when we initially saw Saturn Girl, she was screaming about how people were going to die. The Legion of Superheroes was going to die. DC's main superhero teams were going 
going to die. Everybody was going to die and no one could do anything to stop it. And so the indication seems to be here that like the home hockey team going against the, the opposing hockey team, the home guys are the superheroes. The opposing team is the Watchmen or Dr. Manhattan or whatever they happen to represent. And the home superheroes are getting obliterated and somebody significant is going to die. Now, of course, this entire time, Batman's really just kind of meddling around and messing around with the button that belonged to the comedian. But the crazy thing about this is that while messing with the button, it suddenly has this interaction with the mask of Psycho Pirate. Now, this is one of the reasons that I'm really glad we covered Batman Rebirth, you know, when with all the different stories and things like that. And you'll find that playlist down in the description because this is going to go in the Watchmen playlist. But inside that playlist, we also have everything from, you know, before Watchmen, or at least all the videos we've done before Watchmen, as well as the whole discussion about, you know, Batman and Flash and so on and so forth. But the fact remains here with the Psycho Pirate's mask, it's not really the Psycho Pirate's mask so much as it's called the Medusa mask. And what it does is it basically manipulates the emotions of others by reflecting its own face. So the Medusa mask will take on the face of sadness and that individual who's looking upon the Medusa mask will feel sadness. The same thing with happiness, anger, you know, remorse, so on and so forth, compassion, that whole thing. And so because of that, the button reacting with the mask results in Bruce Wayne seeing his father, Thomas Wayne, from the Flashpoint universe. And that's why things are so crazy. Now, if you're new and you never saw my Flashpoint videos, you'll find those on the playlist as well. Everything that you need to understand what's going on right now is in that playlist. So all you got to do is go there, click play, and you'll be caught up. But assuming that you don't really have the chance to do that, or you don't really have a, a whole lot of time, the Flashpoint universe was a byproduct of Barry Allen. Remember, the Flashpoint universe is basically what initiated the new 52. Barry Allen went back in time to save his mom's life and was successful in doing so. But because of the fact that she survived and because Barry Allen essentially never became the Flash, the motivation for him being the Flash never existed. Ultimately, it led to him just being a normal human being. But it also spawned a wholly different universe that saw a very dark scenario. We ended up seeing that uh, the Atlanteans and the Amazons ended up going to war with one another. Superman never became Superman. He landed, he was discovered by the US government, and he was held underground in stasis for almost his entire life. One of the most significant developments in the Flashpoint universe was that instead of Bruce Wayne's parents dying, having been shot to death, instead, Bruce Wayne was killed. His father became Batman and his mother became the Joker. And so it was so cool. It was so awesome. Such an amazing piece of storytelling for us to be able to see. But this illusion is basically Batman seeing his father as he existed in the Flashpoint universe. Now, of course, that begs the question of all the ways in which he could envision his father. Why is he seeing the Flashpoint version? You would think that if it was a hallucination, you would think that his father in his mind's eye manifested in a physical form. It would happen by way of him seeing his father as he remembers him. So again, it's basically King telling us not everything you're seeing is the way you would expect it to see. And there's a lot more more at play here. And so, of course, what is up happening? And this is when we get to the one minute window, when everything happens in the span of one minute. Bruce Wayne contacts the Flash, says, hey, this button that we've been looking at, it had a reaction to Psycho Pirate's Medusa mask. I need you to get over here so we can analyze it and we can see what's going on. The Flash says, OK, I'm dealing with these bad guys. I'll be over there. The clock starts one minute from the time this clock starts until the time we get to the end of this comic. Everything takes place in the span of one minute minute. And the craziest thing about this is that immediately, almost immediately after this conversation ends, Batman hangs up. He ends up seeing a spark of lightning. His thought is that it's Barry Allen and it's not. It's Eobard Thawne, the reverse Flash. Now, one of the big questions that a lot of current Flash readers are going to have is how is this Eobard Thawne? Eobard Thawne is locked up in Iron Heights. We saw that in the Flash story. He's currently in prison. His current version is in prison. One of the craziest things when it comes to, to Eobard Thawne is he is intrinsic tied into time travel. And so while the present day Eobard Thawne is stuck in prison in three hours or five hours or three days or five days or a month or even, you know, 15 years from now, he ends up getting free somewhere along the line. We don't know how, and it's not really important. What we know is that this is Eobard Thawne being here from at some point in the past or possibly even in the, in the future. And so Eobard Thawne, because of how he exists, because he's so immersed in time travel, it's entirely possible for him to exist in two places at the same time. And so what ends up happening here is that he starts talking to Batman about how a greater power had called out to him. It had basically reached out to him and he was essentially resurrected. And so the funny thing about this is Batman faces off against, you know, Eobard Thawne as best he can, but he doesn't stand a chance. I mean, Eobard Thawne is a struggle for Barry Allen to beat. And Barry Allen is wildly powerful in terms of, you know, his speed and capabilities and so on and so forth. Dare I say, one of the most powerful members of the Justice League. Batman's just a guy with resources and stuff, but being 
caught off guard, being hit five, six, seven times in the span of a second makes it virtually impossible for him to pro provide any kind of counterpunch, any kind of offer to what it is that Eobard Thawne is doing. Now, what ends up happening is that Eobard Thawne actually discovers the letter that Batman received from his father, and that was a part of the Flashpoint story. When the Flashpoint story began to come to an end, uh, Thomas Wayne had basically written a note for his son and given and gave it to Barry Allen, the reason being because of the fact that Barry Allen, when he met Thomas Wayne as Batman in the Flashpoint universe, said, hey, look, this is not how things are supposed to be. In the universe that I come from, you and your wife died, and your son became Batman. And so the result is that Thomas wrote a letter to his son, he gave it to Barry Allen, Barry Allen went back in time, stopped himself from saving his mother's life, things more or less went back to normal, but resulted in the New 52 reboot, but at the end of Flashpoint, he gave Thomas Wayne's note to Bruce Wayne. And for one of the only times in the history of DC Comics, Bruce Wayne cried. It was an emotional moment. It was really probably probably the best possible ending to that story. It was, it was insanely well done. But in the midst of all this, Eobard Thawne more or less kind of makes fun of Batman and then just rips it all up. Now, Eobard Thawne starts saying things like, you know, did it make you feel better, Thomas, and things like that. The reason why is because of the fact that within the Flashpoint universe, Eobard Thawne was there. Eobard Thawne taunted Barry Allen. You know, Eobard Thawne and, and Barry kind of went hand in hand in that particular story. Again, we're leaving a little bit out here in terms of Flashpoint, but of course, like I said, we have those videos. You're welcome to go back and watch them and, and get the full impact of the story itself. And so Eobard Thawne knew who Thomas Wayne was, mostly because of the fact that Thomas Wayne was the one that killed him. So <laughs> because of that, he's pretty, he's pretty aware of who Thomas Wayne is. But the fact remains here that Batman having the letter from his father ripped to pieces and thrown away is crushing. I mean, it's absolutely crushing for him because it's the last connection he had to his dad, the last connection that he had to him. Now, of course, Batman seizes the opportunity to basically, you know, stab Eobard Thawne in the foot and just kind of keep him pinned to the ground and then just beat him up a little bit. But ultimately, what we end up finding out is the whole purpose of Batman fighting against Eobard Thawne was to serve as a distraction. The distraction being what was supposed to be the arrival of Barry Allen. The problem with this is that in the middle of this whole thing, Eobard Thawne picks up the button and vanishes, disappears, returns, and in probably the greatest points, one of the greatest points in this whole story, he starts freaking out about how he saw God. He's like, I saw God! And he just starts losing his mind and then just sort of explodes in this massive, you know, melting deterioration of Speed Force Lightning. And then Barry Allen simply just shows up after it's all said and done. Keep in mind, from the time this, this comic started to the time this comic finished, it's maybe been five minutes maybe five minutes, probably more along the lines of like three or four. But it is so cool to see this happen because Barry Allen suddenly gets here and he's like, what in the hell happened? Like what? <laughs> One minute you call me and the next Eobard Thawne is laying dead and you're, you're clinging on to dear life. And so now the question becomes, who killed Reverse Flash? What in the world happened? Oh my God, Rob Core, man. Man, man, let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something, man. This story is amazing. <laughs> man, let me tell you something, man. Okay, okay. Dude, this this story, man. This comic's an emotional roller coaster. Like it is just, it is so good. Oh my god, it's it's some of the best story to man. If God was writing comics right now, is what it would look like right now. It is, it's so good. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's 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 get into this. All right, let's 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 talk about this. So what we end up doing is we actually kind of go back maybe by about two or three minutes before Bruce Wayne and Barry Allen show up in the Flashpoint universe. And really, what Thomas Wayne does is. Just kind of give us a recount of what it was that happened in Flashpoint. Again, you guys are welcome to check those videos out. Those videos should keep you abreast of everything that's going on. But the idea is that we're basically just kind of told that, you know, where we initially thought that the war would end, you know, with regards to the death of Eobard Thawne, with Barry Allen going back in time to allow his mother to die, to keep himself from saving his mom's life, where that initially just kind of jump-started the New 52, we were left to believe that Flashpoint ended, that that was just a, a pocket universe. The universe was created when Barry Allen saved his mother's life, and the universe was destroyed when Barry Allen allowed his mother to die. But what we end up finding out here is that's not the case. Flashpoint kept going on and it shouldn't have. It should not have gone on at all. It should have stopped. It should have ended. It should have just been cut off from the source. But the problem is that it's still floating out there and not even Thomas Wayne knows why. Thomas Wayne's just kind of like, you know, this shouldn't be here anymore. The reason for why this universe existed has basically been undone. The universe should have vanished with it. Not only that, we end up finding out that because Flashpoint still exists, the war between the Amazons and the Atlanteans just kept going. Aquaman and Wonder Woman are still 
still at war. Now, eventually, they end up joining forces against Thomas Wayne himself because of the fact that Thomas Wayne tried to lead an insurgency against them and basically bring them down. But the issue here is that within his own home, within what's left of Wayne Manor, he began planting all different kinds of explosives so that when his back was against the wall and there was no other choice, he was going to blow it all up and take himself with it. And at the moment when he's getting ready to hit this button, the Flash and Batman show up. Now, this is huge because this is the first time that Thomas Wayne and Bruce Wayne meet each other. This has never happened. And it's such an emotional moment between the two of them because, you know, remember, Barry Allen's seen all this. He's met Thomas Wayne before. He was in the Flashpoint universe. They're not new to him. But even Barry Allen says it shouldn't be this way. Things shouldn't be like this. This universe should be gone. Someone somewhere is keeping this universe alive. And so again, further down the rabbit hole, we're just tumbling down that rabbit hole alongside Alice because someone here has so much power. Somebody out there, presumably Dr. Manhattan, has so much power that they can control and maintain universes as they see fit. And so that's kind of the crazy scenario here is because what we also end up having is that where so many questions are being asked, so many things are, are more or less being hinted at, we end up finding out that the questions more or less kind of have to be cut short. And the reason why is because of the fact that the forces of the Amazons and the Atlanteans are racing down to take out, you know, Thomas Wayne and end his insurgency. And so, of course, again, the funny thing about this is remember, Thomas Wayne in the, the Flashpoint universe was a lot more ruthless and violent than Bruce Wayne. He did not have the same kind of restraint. And that worked just because of the fact that instead of a child losing his parents, it was a parent losing their child. And that has a way of shifting people in a fundamental manner that makes them drastically different than the way they used to be. Really, it was like Thomas Wayne looked around, he lost his wife who became the Joker, he lost his son who was murdered. There was no reason for him to even care anymore. And so he did whatever it was that he had to do in order to try his best to restore some order to everything that's going on. But not only that, for the Batman fan, and indeed, even for just like the general comic book fan, we get to see Batman and his father, Thomas Wayne, fight alongside one another. And it's so cool to see this because what we end up doing, of course, is we basically have Barry Allen repairing the cosmic treadmill, you know, of course, it's super speed and, and that kind of thing, in order to basically get themselves out of there. Now, at this point, you know, once these forces are, you know, more or less subdued, there's this really beautiful moment between Batman and, and his father, Thomas. Really, Thomas kind of begins talking to Bruce about the memories, or at least the memory that they mutually share with regards to their own past experiences. Now, this is really important. And the reason why is because in the Flashpoint stories, we never really got a whole bunch of uh, really in, any in-depth analysis in terms of what the histories of the characters were like before the events of Flashpoint in relation to the main DC universe. All we got was basically, hey, here's what led up to the Flashpoint story, you know, led up to the events in the Flashpoint universe. And that was really about it. But what we end up finding out is that there was a point where the memories, really the, the, the timeline of the DC universe for Thomas in the Flashpoint universe and Bruce in the main DC universe were exactly the same. The divergence was presumably when Barry Allen never became the Flash. And so because of this, you know, they end up talking about, a, you know, when, when Bruce Wayne fell down the cave. Now, of course, we don't get super in-depth into this. Instead, you know, what we end up finding out is, of course, you know, Thomas was whispering for the most part because he didn't want to, you know, disturb the bats and kind of cause panic or anything like that. But in the midst of them having this conversation, getting ready to, to basically go about their business, someone presumably just wipes out the Flashpoint universe. They just begin the process of eroding it all. Now, again, this is just a crazy decision display of power. I mean, just an astronomical display of power, but we still don't know what's going on. And even Barry kind of hypothesizes on this. Was it a singular being out there who was keeping the universe alive and chose to go ahead and allow the universe to die? Was it almost like they had their foot on the gas and on the brake and all they had to do was let off the brake and that car was just ready to go? Or is the universe just kind of wiping out now? Is it just one of these things with, with regards to Barry Allen's actions that when he, went, when he went back and allowed his mother to die, the effects of his actions in basically eliminating the flash point universe are just now catching up to things and the universe is just now beginning to be wiped away. They don't know what the answer to that question is. The implication is that it's Dr. Manhattan who's just destroying that universe, but we don't know. But in this last little bit of a conversation, and this is when the story gets so emotional, in this last little bit of a conversation, Bruce Wayne tells his father Thomas, you have a grandson. I have a son named Damien. You know, you have a grandson. And this is when things begin to radically shift because Bruce beseeches his father to join them, to come with them, to get them out of there. And when up happening is Thomas just kind of pushes him, you know, onto the cosmic treadmill and tells the Flash to get him out of there. And this is where really I think the stage is set for the future of what's going to happen with the Batman concept. Thomas basically tells his son, stop being Batman. 
you know, when I had you, I knew that I'd made all the right choices because it led me to you. Like I, I know that I made all the right calls because I had you as a son and that you're the, you're the greatest gift that I ever could have had. But he says, don't be Batman, be a father, let go of your anger, let go of your pain, let go of your struggle and your strife, let all that go and just be a man be happy, be a father for your son in the way that I never could. Now, what this seems to indicate is that we're going to see Batman kind of taking his father's words to heart and maybe just vacating the landscape, maybe walking away. And the stage is being set in a lot of different ways. For example, in Nightwing, uh, in the, what is it, Nightwing Must Die storyline, the one that we just covered, Damian Wayne's whole irritation is the idea that Nightwing will take up the mantle when Batman retires instead of Damian himself. We know Duke is being trained for something in particular. All the roads really seem to lead to this idea that Bruce Wayne is going to vacate the role of Batman, or maybe he won't. Maybe he'll just stay Batman. You know, maybe he'll just be like, you know, I've got to live up to the legacy of what my father did and, and that kind of thing. We don't really know. But in these moments, you know, in these final moments, we end up having this, this beautiful segment when we learn what it was that Thomas said to his son when Bruce fell down into the cave. And Bruce asked the question, why are you whispering? And Thomas said, because we don't want to disturb the bats. Bruce, of course, apologized by saying, I'm sorry I fell in the cave. His father responded by saying, it's okay, sometimes we fall. But remember, Remember, Wayne's never stayed down. And then like he just charges headlong into this conflict and he's like, we rise. And it's like the coolest thing because we don't know what's on the other side of this light. All we know is that something's there. And regardless of what it is, Thomas Wayne is just fearless. The guy goes out like a hero, just runs headlong into whatever it is that's there, presumably his own death. And that's the end of him and the universe that he resides in. And so it's just this incredibly emotional moment because it's Thomas Wayne meeting with his son. It's Bruce Wayne meeting with his father. It's the two of them being able to reconcile. And while Thomas had so many things he wanted to say to his son, the main message was sent across, go find happiness. Stop living this life of anger and misery and deceit. Go be a happy person. Stop letting the death of myself, the death of your mother dominate your life. Just go live. And so while the question is being asked, what in the world happened? We end up having like Eobard Thawne racing up behind them. Now, again, this kind of asks the question, where did Eobard Thawne come from? He was supposed to have been dead. Of course, you know, we basically have Batman answering this question for us. So this is Eobard Thawne before he ended up killed in the Batcave itself. And so, you know, this is one of those things where Eobard Thawne can exist essentially in two places at the same time. Now, we don't know where he's coming from. All he says is that he's seen who it was that this button belongs to. He knows the power of the person that this button belongs to. He knows what they're capable of. They've never faced someone like me. Now, this has huge implications for the story because what this does is this asks several possibilities. We know by virtue of the solicitations for The Flash, number 22, the fourth part of the story, really the final part of the story, that it seems like Jay Garrick is going to be involved in some form or fashion. Whether it's his return, whether it's his debut, whatever the case may be, he will be involved in some way. Now, if Eobard Thawne were to meet Jay Garrick, right off the bat, he'd be able to figure out Jay Garrick's just not fast enough to keep up with him. Jay Garrick doesn't know about him. Jay Garrick's, you know, just too honorable, too good, whatever the case may be. But Jay Garrick has never faced anybody like Eobard Thawne. That's a possibility. It could be that Eobard Thawne met one of the Watchmen. Maybe he met the comedian before he died. Maybe he met Ozymandias, you know, and his idea is, well, hey, they've never faced anybody like me. I'm so dangerous. I'm so crazy. They'll never be able to stand against someone like me. Maybe he glimpsed the power, glimpsed uh, Dr. Manhattan, you know, maybe Dr. Manhattan doing something or just kind of meddling about his own business. And Eobard Thawne underestimates the power of Dr. Manhattan and simply says, they've never faced anyone like me before. They've never faced anybody as powerful and as, as crazy as my abilities are. I'm just that good at what I do. Now, in truth, that final option with the whole idea with Dr. Manhattan, that is the most logical scenario. One, because of how Eobard Thawne reacted, freaking out, talking about how he saw God. Two, because Eobard Thawne is arrogant enough to legitimately believe that no one like Dr. Manhattan had ever seen a power like his before, and that as fast as he is, and as capable as he is, that he could somehow overpower Dr. Manhattan. Those are entirely possible ideas. But as we know, just by virtue of what we saw in the second part of the button, that does not work out in his favor. That sure, he's very arrogant, that sure, he's very cocky, but his actions get the better of him, and Eobard Thawne ultimately dies. Rob Core. Man, let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something, huh? Y'all know what's about to happen. <laughs> the button. 
Yes! The button! The conclusion of the button. I can't talk too loud right now because I'm in a hotel room. I'm in Disney World. But man, let me tell you something, man. I would not normally stop going to Disney World to record something, but I will stop going to Disney World to record the button. Man, let me tell you something, man. If God was writing DC Comics right now, this is what it would look like right now. This is some of the best comic book writing that I've ever seen that I have ever seen. And I've seen Jonathan Hickman write stuff. I am reading Jeff John's Green Lantern right now. <laughs> this is such a good story. So in the last video, we had picked up with the idea that Eobard Thawne was finally caught up to by Batman and Barry Allen the Flash. So it was almost like the events were just gonna circle right back around to the beginning, right? Like it was back to the scene where Eobard Thawne just kind of showed up in you know the Batcave, he talked to Batman, they fought for a little bit for like the span of you know one second or something along those lines. Uh, he disappeared, reappeared, ranted about seeing God, and then died. This gives us that cool moment. And this is what I love about Eobard Thawne. This is one of the things I love about his characters. Eobard Thawne is like, fearless, right? I mean, he's arrogant and he has every right to be. This story confirms exactly what we've been thinking, that Eobard Thawne is timeless in every sense of the word. Eobard Thawne, as we see him here, is the same Eobard Thawne that appeared in the Mark Wade stories, the old Mark Wade Flash stories, The Return of Barry Allen. This is the Eobard Thawne from Flashpoint. This is the Eobard Thawne from Flash Rebirth before DC Rebirth. This is the same Eobard Thawne that we've been reading for years and years and years. He's arrogant, he's coggy, and it works. But the crazy thing about all this is that in this moment, it's Barry Allen trying to reason with him, right? Like it's Barry Allen trying to say, look, dude, if you keep down this path, you're going to die. But it's the cocky nature of Eobard Thawne coming right back to Barry and saying, you can't stop me. I'm timeless. Like I've been killed and I always come back. I am part and parcel to the negative speed force. I am part and parcel to surviving. I will always find a way back. And he always does. But this is the one scenario where he can't. Now, again, the funny thing about Williamson kind of hitting back on the idea that this is the reverse flash that we've known for so long is when he starts referencing the things that he did to Barry Allen, going back in time, manipulating his life so that he would become the flash. That was established by Jeff Johns during Flash Rebirth when Barry Allen was first brought back prior to the start of the New 52 and eventually DC Rebirth. We have Eobard Thawne talking about the idea of taking Barry Allen, going all the way back to the very early days when he first became the flash, kidnapping him as a child, raising him as his own, and making him an acolyte, which begs the question, what would Barry Allen look like as the reverse flash what kind of version of barry allen would we be seeing in that particular scenario but at the end of the day it doesn't matter they're simply too late you know eobard thawne arrives to the destination of where the button was taking him and this is when we find out kind of <laughs> who it was that he saw now the way that williamson does this is beautiful it's so beautiful because all we get is thawne just kind of talking to this person saying hey look you remain hidden from everybody no one knows everything that you've done but you you can reveal yourself to me. I'm your friend. You know, I can't be killed or anything like that. I'm the one constant. If anybody can understand what it is that you've done with time, it's me. Give me the knowledge that you have. And this is kind of funny because Williamson is playing it fast and loose here. Because if you look, the indication is that Manhattan is in the button. That Eobard Thawne is literally talking to the button. Now, we as readers know that it's not necessarily that way. We as readers know that for the most part, this is really just the button operating as a key of sorts, you know, in the since somebody grabs it, it takes them to a preordained location and they meet Dr. Manhattan. And this is exactly what happened with, with Eobard Thawne. He meets Manhattan, but he's totally overwhelmed by the power that he's seeing. I mean, this is really kind of DC showing us where Dr. Manhattan stands in the realm of his capabilities. Now, the funny thing about this is that along the way, we get this disembodied voice that's basically saying, Barry Allen was the key to saving Wally West. Barry Allen can save me too. All he has to do is listen. Now, from the solicitations, when the covers were just being issued out to everybody, the the implication here was that it was Jay Garrick. And the question was going to be, how will we get Jay Garrick back? Because keep in mind, Jay Garrick hails from Earth 2. He hails from the age of the golden age of superheroes, that universe, which is Earth 2. All the original superheroes from the 1930s, 1940s, even some of the, the early 1950s, that's all Earth 2. When DC revamped Earth 2 in the new 52, Jay Garrick that we saw then was nothing like the one that we saw now. Totally different, completely removed, 
totally separate from the character we were used to. And so the idea here is that the Jay Garrick that we knew was just kind of lost in time. Now, this is not the first time that DC has done this. Remember, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, there was only one universe. And so in order to bring in Alan Scott, in order to bring in Jay Garrick, those various characters that had their run in the Justice Society of America, the JSA, as it was written by Jeff Johns, they had to find a way to roll them in into a universe that didn't have a multiverse, into one universe that the main DC heroes resided in. So it looks like they're going back to that. They're basically saying, hey, look, we've only got one universe here. I mean, Earth 2, that's already happened, whatever. We've only got one universe here. We have to find a way to bring Jay Garrick in. And that was my initial response. That was my initial thought. And I was hyped to see that. But kind of jumping back here to, to Eobard Thawne, the great thing about this is that he's just overwhelmed with power. And again, this is really just DC saying, here's how powerful Dr. Manhattan is. I mean, here's just the level of strength that he has, something hitherto unseen by Eobard Thawne. And you gotta remember, Eobard Thawne's fought everyone. Eobard Thawne has fought the Justice League. He's fought the Flash. He's fought some of the most powerful beings in the DC universe and come out on top. You know, heavy hitters like Superman and so on and so forth, they're nothing to scoff at. The fear that Eobard Thawne shows here is something that we've never seen. This is a childlike expression. It's the realization that he has stepped into uncharted waters, that he's called down the beast and the beast has answered. And it's far more than Eobard Thawne ever expected. And in light of this, he effectively loses his life. Now, this is kind of crazy because in this moment, Batman having heard this disembodied voice of Jay Garrick, Barry Allen failing to pick it up, ultimately means that Jay Garrick makes his presence known when Barry finally acknowledges the sound of the voice, meaning that the memory of Jay Garrick is now alive and well, and Jay Garrick survives only through memories, meaning if Barry Allen can grab this memory and bring it into reality, then Jay Garrick will very much be alive, and this is what we get. Now, the reason why I love this particular moment in this comic book is because golden golden age superheroes especially when they're drawn by Alex Ross, they invoke a kind of emotion, this visceral feeling that I can never shake every time I see it. I've said it a million times before and I'll say it a million times again. There is this amazing shot that Alex Ross drew where you've got like the superheroes running towards the screen and you've got Superman holding the American flag and he's surrounded by all these other Golden Age superheroes. And it reminds you of an era when superheroes were truthful, when there was no moral ambiguity. It wasn't, well, maybe we're good guys, maybe we're bad guys. There were no anti-heroes. There were good guys and there were bad guys. The good guys did the good thing, the bad guys did the bad thing. They fought, the good guys won, the day was saved, and that was it. Jay Garrick is a return to that. Jay Garrick is a return to this era when superheroes walked a little bit taller, you know, when they were a little clearer, when they just kind of made you feel hopeful. And that's why Jay Garrick's return here is so significant. The saddest thing about this is that it's so short-lived. Jay Garrick tries to pull the same road that, that Wally West said, or Wally West appeared to Barry Allen and said, you have to remember me. If you don't remember me, I will be gone. I will die. That'll be the end of me. Of course, Barry Allen, trying his best, is not able to do it. But notice what happens here. Notice what takes place here. Jay Garrick doesn't really die per se, or at least it doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, he's just immersed in blue energy and whisked away. And so the indication seems to be here that Barry was going to remember who he was. Barry was going to remember him and say, oh, you're Jay Garrick, I remember you now. But in that fraction of a second before it happened, Jay Garrick was whisked away presumably by Dr. Manhattan. And that begs the question, is Dr. Manhattan building his own army? Is he building his own superheroes, his own villains to go against the traditional DC superheroes? Is that what we're effectively going to see? The Justice Society of America versus the Justice League of America with the JLA on the side of good and the JSA on the side of Dr. Manhattan. It begs that question. What are we going to see? Because I have a hard time believing that Jay Garrick would be brought back as popular of a character as he is among the Flash family and as many people have been looking forward towards his return, I have a hard time believing that he would be brought here and then just prominently whisked away and that would be the end of him. But what this story does as it starts to wrap up is it basically looks at this entire event from the perspectives of The Flash, Barry Allen, and Batman, Bruce Wayne. From Barry Allen's ideology, he basically says, look, this case is far from over. This is not going to stop. I'm going to keep trying to find out, you know, trying to find out who this person was that killed Eobard Thawne. Because remember, Bruce Wayne and, and you know, Barry Allen, they don't know about Dr. Manhattan. They don't, they didn't see anything that Eobard Thawne saw. They don't know the Manhattans out there. All they know is that some just wildly powerful force killed Thawne and whisked away Jay Garrick, or at least from their assumption, Jay Garrick seems to be dead, basically kind of dissipated and that's really the end of him. But the other thing here, and this is what's so cool about this, is that Batman 
reflects on the words of his father, where his father says, find happiness. Do not be Batman. Go and be a father to your son. Leave that life behind because it will only lead you down the road of anger and sadness, a life that's not worth having, a life that you really can't look back on and find any small measure of peace in. And so in the moment when the bat signal goes out and when Alfred asks the question, are you going to respond to that? Batman just kind of drops his head and it looks like Bruce Wayne will not be Batman. Is he quitting? Is he leaving? Is Damian Wayne going to take up the role? So many questions are presented here. And so in this last little bit, we have Dr. Manhattan picking up this button. And this is, God, this is beautiful. God, this is, man, man, man let me tell you something, man. This is, <laughs> this is gorgeous. Dr. Manhattan picking up this button, making this statement about how everything is preordained. Dr. Manhattan is a slave to time. He can't break time. He can't violate time. We know that perspective from before Watchmen, Dr. Manhattan. We covered that. We talked about that. You'll find that link down in the description. Dr. Manhattan is like, look, everything that I say and do is preordained. I can't break away from time. I am a, I'm as much of a prisoner of it as anybody else is. And so then the question has to be asked, is Dr. Manhattan being altruistic here? Is he doing what he believes to be the right thing? And if so, where does this road lead? What happens with all of this? It raises more questions than it answers. Damn it, if this is not one of the best stories that's ever been written in DC Comics. Oh my god, Rob Core, man. Let me tell you something. Man, son! <laughs> I ain't even angry. I'm just that excited. Oh my god, man. I'm so excited. Dude, this man. I wish y'all could see me right now, man. The story, man. Like, dude, the ending to this. Let me tell you something, man. Eobard Thawne. Man, Eobard Thawne. Eobard Thawne is one of my favorite villains of all time. One of the best villains that there's ever been in the history of, like, any comic book publication ever. He's got so much character. He's got so much pizzazz. He's got so much of that stuff that's just like, oh, man, if I could be a bad guy, I'd be him. <laughs> that's pretty messed up. But this follows the whole idea of the butt, right? Like, this is just the epilogue to the button leading into a new story running scared but god in heaven if this is not just freaking amazing joshua williamson man man let me tell you something right now man if god was writing the flash right now this is what it would look like right now this, this is just it's just an amazing it's just an amazing story all right let's calm down let's calm down because we spent like a minute saying pretty much nothing <laughs> let's calm down let's relax so the cool thing about this is that this initially picks up in the 25th century right well at least it, it does to a degree and we get this sort of back and forth thing now in terms of like jumping between like explanations or jumping between between points in time, this only really happens twice. It only really happens this time and one other time. But it's designed to mimic the nature of Eobard Thawne, and we'll get to that here in a second. But jumping back, I mean, what this really just kind of does is it actually changes things. It turns them on its head because it goes through this whole legacy of all the different flashes that have ever existed. For example, the Godspeed uniform is there, which basically tells us that following the introduction of the Speed Force storm across this across uh, Central City and Godspeed gaining his powers, that the future was retroactively affected by what it is that took place in the past, resulting in Godspeed and being introduced to the whole idea of the Flash mythos. But it shows us all these different iterations. Barry Allen, Wally West, you know, the classic Wally West, the New 52 Wally West, all these different versions. But the huge difference here is that we're basically told about the character of Eobard Thawne and that instead of the two of them being enemies, the two of them are actually allies, or at least that's the story that's being given to us. Now, this is cool because remember, Eobard Thawne is a guy that was obsessed with the concept of Barry Allen. He was obsessed with the idea of the Flash. He was never connected to him. He wasn't part of the family line or anything like that. He was just a guy in the future who was obsessed with the idea of the Flash. He basically had surgery done to make himself look like Barry Allen. He gave himself speed four powers. He went into the past with the intention of meeting Barry only to basically lose his way when he arrived due to the effects of time travel and then going through and looking at the Flash's, uh, you know, museum, coming to the realization that he was destined to be the Flash's most notable enemy. He had a psychotic break and the two of them became two of the most popular foes to have ever existed in comic books. And so what we do is we follow up with this little bit of a, of a intro here with the present day picking up with the idea of Barry Allen. Now, what Joshua Williamson does here is actually pretty genius because we know that Eobard Thawne simply can't die. Eobard Thawne is effectively immortal for one of two reasons. The first is the reason as it's explained here, and the second is the nature of Eobard Thawne, which we'll talk about as we get, you know, as we, we get further into the
of this video. But with regards to this little segment here, what Barry Allen basically says is that whoever it was that quote unquote destroyed Eobard Thawne didn't actually destroy him. Instead, they basically slowed him down, slowed down his connection to the, you know, to the speed force, the negative speed force in his case. And, uh, and ultimately it basically slowed down his healing factor, but his body's still recovering. And that's the cool thing about this, because remember, when it comes to speedsters, so long as they're connected to the speed force, their body will heal. And so in the case of Eobard Thawne, because he's so powerful, because he's the only person that draws on the negative speed force, this sort of antithesis to the speed force proper, then what it means is that all that energy basically flows directly into him and he doesn't really have to share it with anybody. So it's like if Barry Allen was the only Flash that existed, the speed force would flow entirely into him and nobody else. Again, this is kind of a necessary thing because if the speed force were a battery, then it's like having a battery that a phone's charging off of and a radio's charging off of and a multitude of other things. The more things you have hooked up to that battery, the faster you're going to drain its life. The speed force is the exact same way. And so with regards to this whole idea of Eobard Thawne, what it means is that despite him having been, you know, quote unquote, killed or at least presumed to have been killed by Dr. Manhattan, uh, he was really more just like incinerated, but his body physically survived. And so because his body physically survived, he will simply just heal. Now, this tells us that in order for Eobard Thawne to be destroyed in any one particular place in time, you'd have to totally incinerate his body. But the fact remains, Eobard Thawne simply cannot die. And the reason why we get into this is because of the fact that Barry Allen, of course, basically had a birthday party thrown for him by Iris West and the various members of the, you know, the Central City Crime Labs and or I guess Star Labs and so on and so forth. And it's really just kind of a celebratory thing. But the entire time this is happening, Barry's doing nothing more than just kind of recollecting on the events of the button. You know, this guy with this weird funky helmet that Barry never, you know, doesn't know who he is. Of course, we know that's Jay Garrick. And that's the coolest thing is because when DC launched the new 52, they basically reinvigorated Earth 2, this alternate reality where the golden age of superheroes resided. And the reason why that matters is because in classic DC, Earth 2 was eliminated after Crisis on Infinite Earths and eventually came back during Infinite Crisis. Jay Garrick was like old man Flash, right? Like he was just this older guy who just ran not nearly as fast as Barry Allen, but he ran pretty fast, but he brought a kind of wisdom and a kind of hope to the Flash family that really wasn't available from anybody else just because he'd been the Flash in his own universe for so incredibly long. And he Humanity really kind of viewed that reality's version of superheroes a little different than they did in the main DC universe. Now, if you were to look, for example, at like an, an Alex Ross rendering of uh, Jay Garrick, if you feel some kind of surge of hope or kind of this feeling of nostalgia or something along those lines, that's what DC was always trying to put forward when it came to the character of, uh, of Jay Garrick. Whether it was in the nature of the stories that were being told, the way that he was drawn, the events as they were unfolding, whenever it is that Jay Garrick showed up, sure, he wouldn't be able to defeat Eobard Thawne, but the hope that he brought with him, the nostalgia, the kind of reinvigoration, the, hey, we can pull this off. That kind of feeling was always like the little bit of an extra boost that like Barry or Wally or somebody needed in order to basically take on or take out whatever villain they were facing off against. So it was really kind of a cool thing. You know, that's why I always loved him as old man Flash, because he's just kind of this great, you know, this, this great bit of invigoration here. But remember during the events of DC Rebirth with the button, with New 52, Jay Garrick was kind of rebooted, but people didn't really care for him too much. His character was all right, but if they had to choose between like the classic Jay Garrick or the modern, you know, modern Jay Garrick, they would choose the classic Jay Garrick. The modern Jay Garrick wasn't terrible, not by any standard of measurement. It wasn't anything like that. It was just kind of a nostalgia thing for a lot of older readers. And so DC Rebirth was sort of teasing the idea that Jay Garrick is going to come back. And the way that we know this is because by the statements that are made in this particular story, when we read the button, we were kind of left to believe that maybe Jay Garrick was incinerated. He was being held captive somewhere. He escaped just in the nick of time, or at least was able to get out just in the nick of time to help Barry and, uh, and Bruce Wayne escape the time stream. And then was yanked back in again. We didn't know if he was killed. We didn't really know what it was that was going on. All we knew was that much like the classic Wally West, the only way for Jay Garrick to escape his confinement, so to speak, was for Barry Allen to remember who he was and tether him to the main DC universe instead of wherever it was that he was being held. But because Barry couldn't remember who he was, Jay Garrick just kind of went back to whatever stasis pod or, you know, whoever it was that was holding on to him, presumably Dr. Manhattan. But what this tells us is that Jay Garrick's not dead. He was just taken back to wherever he was being held from, which means that Jay Garrick Garrick will probably come back somewhere along the line. It's Williamson, it's DC saying, hey guys, look, just because Jay Garrick, you know, showed up for a second and then vanished, doesn't mean he's gone forever. We're not yanking your chain. He's probably going to come back somewhere along the line. And what it does is it really kind of creates this feeling of like, yeah, like we're getting this great combination of the things that we loved and the things that we love now and kind of being merged and brought together into one thing. But the other half of this is that Barry Allen begins to think back on the idea of Eobard Thawne. And this gets into the second half of our discussion on why Eobard Thawne 
Thrawn cannot be killed. Remember, Eobard Thrawn is, uh, he's, he's part and parcel to time travel. That's just part of who he is. He comes from the 25th century. In the 25th century, on the day that he gave himself powers, and the day that he made himself look like Barry Allen, and the day he traveled back in time, that's a fixed construct. That's never going to change. It's always going to be that way. I mean, I guess Barry could go into the 21st century and kill Thawne, but the whole idea is the fact that Thawne is running around means that he cannot be stopped from ever becoming the Reverse Flash. That's always going to happen. It's an immutable, concrete aspect of the DC timeline. And because of that, no matter how many times Barry Allen kills Eobard Thawne in the future, or in the present, or in the past, no matter who does anything to him, it's irrelevant. Eobard Thawne will always pop back up again because he's always running back and forth through time. So it's almost like there's an infinite number of versions of him. Like a, there's a version of Eobard Thawne for each particular second in time. So, you know, you kill one this second, the one a second from now will pop back up for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's just this idea that he will never leave. He will always be there. And this is kind of cool because I love the character of Eobard Thawne. And we'll, we'll find out how awesome he is as we end up getting, you know, further through this story. But in the middle of this whole birthday party, everything's kind of interrupted by a guy by the name of Danton Black. Now, Danton Black in this story is by no means like a major character, right? Like he's, he's a pretty small time guy. I mean, the whole idea of this is that there's a chick named Sally at this party. She and Danton Black like had a drink and Danton's just like, we're in love. Like it was, <laughs> it was this weird scenario. So he literally shows up here, crashes this party just because he's chasing after some girl. Now, the other half of this and something to keep in mind here is that the party's also visited by Hal Jordan. And that's a cool thing because Hal Jordan and, and you know, really the Flash are kind of extremely strong friends in a lot of ways. It's one of the reasons, you know, Barry Allen becoming like a Blue Lantern, different things like that. There's a very rich history between the two characters, both before the New 52 and during the New 52. And so, again, focusing on the idea of Danton Black, his character really goes by the name Multiplex, and he was a guy who gained his powers, at least before the New 52, gained his powers in the same way, or really during the same uh, explosion that ended up merging Ronnie Raymond and Martin Stein into the character of Firestorm. And so the result is that he's like, you know, multiple man Jimmy Madrox from, uh, from Marvel Comics in the sense that he can make an infinite number of copies of himself. Now, the cool thing about this is that unlike Jamie Madrox, Multiplex is a little more extreme, and it's the extreme nature of his character that makes him so cool, because facing off against Hal Jordan and facing off against The Flash is a pretty difficult task for a lot of people. I mean, one, you're talking about a guy who can move faster than time, faster than death, faster than light and the universe. At the same time, you're talking about Hal Jordan, the greatest of the Green Lanterns, depending on what fan you're talking to, but a guy whose Green Lantern ring can, can allow him to achieve virtually any feat, which includes creating massive, you know, constructs that can just round up all these versions of multiplexes. So the idea is to form like this massive swarm. And that's what makes it so cool because multiplex coming after Flash and after Hal Jordan is like being attacked by a swarm of bees, each one containing basically the orders of multiplex himself and operating akin, you know, akin to what it is that he wants to do. And that's what's so cool about this. Now, of course, the other half is New 52 Wally West and Iris West. And the reason why this is cool is because while she's attending the party alongside Wally, Wally basically, you know, whisks her home and says, hey, look, there's this huge conflict. You don't really need to be here. You're just an average person. You will end up getting yourself hurt. But when they get back to Iris's home, they're met by the arrival of Eobard Thawne. And that's why this is so cool is because this could happen due to any number of factors. It could very well be that it's just some version of Eobard Thawne out there somewhere. It could be that it's Eobard Thawne who basically healed himself. We're not told which one it is. And Eobard Thawne makes no reference to the events of the button, which is to say he makes no reference to the fact that he was totally obliterated and then returned. So this is presumably some other version of Eobard Thawne from a different point in time that hasn't been affected yet by the events of the button. Because remember, with Eobard Thawne's whole idea of time travel, it gets absolutely bonkers. And so I guess we could say that what passes for the past, which is to say any version of Eobard Thawne that has not ended up at the moment where he gets destroyed by Dr. Manhattan could appear at any point in time. This simply seems to be one of those. When it comes to Eobard Thawne, it's, it's, it's hard to avoid the idea of time, but it's also easy to minimize the discussion of time. And so DC treats time travel totally different from Marvel Comics, and it can make things absolutely wild, especially when it comes to the idea of Thawne. Trying to keep things simple here, one other thing to keep in mind is that Eobard Thawne remembers everything before the events of Flashpoint. And that that's what's so cool about this is because this entire discussion, this entire conversation he has with the New 52 Wally West is rooted in the idea as if Eobard Thawne had just walked into the New 52 from classic DC. And so he looks around and he's like, I fought a lot of different versions of Barry Allen's proteges. I fought Impulse. I fought Wally West, you know, the classic Wally West Kid Flash. You 
I don't know who you are. And this is interesting because Eobard Thawne puts the new 52 Wally West to task and demonstrating what he can do. Now, he's not doing it in like a mentor capacity, right? He's like, he's not like, okay, kid, I'm going to train you to be a great Flash because I'm a good guy. Let's see what you can do. It's literally just Eobard Thawne testing him by trying to be the crap out of him. And look at what's happening. I mean, look at this. It's not a contest. And that's what we would expect. Like with the new 52 Wally West, his power's just not there yet. He's just now getting to the point where he can begin harnessing his power in a way that he can get relatively to, uh, close to controlling it. But he's not Barry Allen, and Eobard Thawne is a chore even for Barry. And so it's just, it's night and day. It's its not a contest in any form or fashion. Not only that, the other thing you have to remember about Eobard Thawne is that he is cool, and he is ruthless, and he's cunning, but he's so charismatic. Like, he just pops. You know, that's, that's the coolest thing. That's the best way I can describe him. He's just so cool. Because with Eobard Thawne, it's not a matter of him setting his sights on you and saying, okay, now I'm going to kill you. It doesn't work that way. Eobard Thawne never just targets a person. Eobard Thawne targets you and anyone you've ever met. He goes after your livelihood and the livelihood of everyone you've ever known. He just erases you from existence. And so if he goes through the chronology of your life and he's like, okay, so you were born to your parents. Okay, well, I mean, I guess we can, you know, you're going to be born. So we're going to go ahead and kill your parents. Uh, you also had a really good third grade teacher who helped to make you who you are. So we're going to kill that person. You had a few girlfriends over the course of your high school career. So we're going to kill them. Uh, you fell in love and got married when you were in college. So she's dead now. Uh, and, and that's literally what he does. He's just like, we're just going to kill them all. That's what makes Eobard Thawne so crazy is because it's mind games. It's shadow games. It's every conceivable role, every conceivable task a person can take to obliterate a, a human being from existence, that's exactly what he will do. And so by the time Eobard Thawne gets, goes to work on it, because to quote Ocean's Eleven, first he'll kill you, and then he'll go to work on you. Once he's done, it'll be like you never existed. No one will have ever known your name. No one will ever see your face. You'll, you'll never be there. You'll, it'll be like you were just a person that was never there. You know, and, and that's the craziest thing, is because that's what he does. That's what he, he attempts to go after. Now, the funny thing about this is Iris West. Because remember, this is New 52 Iris West. For reasons that, again, we can only really chalk up to the actions of Dr. Manhattan. We don't really know what it is. Iris West does not remember anything before the New 52. Because remember, what DC's been toying with, with the idea of DC Rebirth, is that back in 2011, when the New 52 first launched, that it was, okay, okay, here's a reboot. Here's new origin stories. These are all brand new lives for all these characters. DC Rebirth came back and said, no, 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 no. That's not what happened. What happened is Barry Allen went back in time, initiated Flashpoint, tried to fix it, and then after the events of Flashpoint, everybody remembered their lives. All these characters were still there, but then presumably Dr. Manhattan stepped in and said, and now all your minds are wiped. Now, as far as all of you guys know, you're new. Iris West doesn't know Barry Allen, not because of the New 52 reboot, but because of the fact that Dr. Manhattan modified her memory so she would forget. That was the whole idea. That's the whole basis behind DC Rebirth. Now, why Dr. Manhattan, assuming it was him, why he did that, we don't know. We're waiting for presumably Doomsday Clock to tell us, which, man, I'm excited about Doomsday Clock. I'm hyped. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm super excited. But these are the things that are kind of being fleshed out. But from Eobard Thawne, his mind wasn't wiped. He remembers everything. He knows everything that's been happening. You know, now, we're kind of left to believe that in the time when he was defeated, you know, after the events of Flashpoint and the time that he reemerged, that's when Dr. Manhattan acted. And so, presumably, it was, you know, it's almost like Eobard Thawne was in a coma and then everything was changing around him and he woke up after it was changed, remembering the way everything used to be. And so he doesn't really know what Dr. Manhattan did. And if he does, he's not telling anybody. And so it's really kind of interesting here because from his perspective, Iris West, the way she views herself and the way she views the world, that's not who she is. And so the goal of Eobard Thawne is to grab Iris West, take her to the 25th century and jog her memory to wake her up. And that's the cool thing here because Barry Allen shows up to the house, right? Like once the whole battle with multiplex is done, once it's all said and done, once he has this conversation with Hal Jordan, Hal Jordan says, look, man, do not be afraid of what will happen. Do not be afraid of the idea that Iris West will leave you if you tell her who you are. Be honest, be open with her. Uh, when he gets back home to basically make that declaration and say, I, Barry Allen, am the Flash, he ends up being met with Wally West, who's just been totally decimated. You know, and of course, uh, Eobarthon left a note inviting Barry to the 25th century, but jumping back to the 25th century proper, the whole idea of, of Eobarthon is to say, I'm going to wake you up. I'm going to, to awaken you to the way things really are. I'm going to take these memories that are suppressed or whatever the case may be, and I'm going to show you who you really are. And so what seems to be happening or what seems to seems like it will happen is that Iris West will remember everything before the New 52. She'll remember everything in classic DC. She'll remember the first time she ever met Barry Allen and fell in love. More so than that, she'll also remember when she married Barry and 
when Eobard Thawne went back in time and killed her. With that being said, guys, <laughs> we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps if you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you drop a like. Ah, this was amazing. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I will catch you all later. Peace.